In this video, we're going to take a look at the word Berserker. Berserker. Wah! quite fascinated with the the modern TV show Vikings and a lot of the movies that are out there uh, there's a lot of expansion in in so-called Hollywood now with with some other uh, projects being released that I've, I've heard of so that could be very interesting and I wanted to have a look at this today uh, and see if we can sort of claw back some of this and have a look at what this word really meant and claw away some of the uh, innuendo perhaps or the fictition that has kind of surrounded the this word as it's evolved over the last thousand or so years. So the word berserker itself is actually a really interesting word because it can be interpreted several different ways and as none of us alive today were alive a thousand years ago, we kind of really struggled to understand the exact context that this word was used in. Berserker can mean bare chest or as in shirtless, or it can also mean bare chest as in bare skin. It's important to understand that spelling for modern English was only standardised in the Victorian period and the same goes with trying to standardise the definitions of different words. So I think as uh, the Vikings were reinvented by the Victorians with their great plays and so on and then more recently by Hollywood uh, from the 1950s forwards and again, more recently, with the, the television show that started to come out about, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. Um, we have this really quite fascinating uh, evolution here. I, I wanted to kind of really explore this a bit more. So, I, I think as well, it's important to understand that a lot of detail has been lost in history. Every time someone has tried to write something down and store that in a safe place, which is typically a building, some other tribe has come along, attacked them, and burnt the buildings down. So, um, we've lost so much history, and there's only really fragments that we really know for sure about this particular period in history, that is the 8th through to the 11th century. We really don't know a whole lot um, about a lot of it, and I'd, I'd like to sort of claw away, as I say, some of the um, mystique of this word. So let's take a bit more of a look. The word berserker, I think if you're hoping for a, a quick, simple, clear-cut video, I can't give you uh, the quick, clear-cut answers that perhaps we might like. And we also need to understand that even many modern historians still disagree around a lot of these subjects. So there is still a great deal of speculation about exactly uh, what some of these words themselves meant. Snorri, a 13th century Icelandic poet, does describe the Viking berserkers, but there's some issues around him. And that is to say that uh, he was alive more than 200 years after the end of the so-called Viking Age. So it's, it's not really primary source because he's lost that access to um, even knowledge that would have been handed down through generations. Um, so there's a lot of speculation there. However, he describes Vi Viking berserkers as uh, being fearsome and fanatical and shield biting. Let's take a little bit of a look at that. You also need to understand that at the time of Snorri there was a, a lot of 
suppression by some Christian clerics uh, far more later on, uh, but there was a great deal of suppression of the pagan religions and the heathen religions and uh, a lot of the cultures that were outside Christianity by many, but not all, uh, Christian clerics. So this um, meant that a lot of these traditions and a lot of these, this knowledge was itself lost. And we don't know what happened to a lot of it uh, where, and, and where it all went. In 1784, a Swedish theologian speculated that berserkers uh, may have been using mushrooms. Now, this is an interesting theory. I disagree with it. Um, because if you're under the effect of mushrooms, then it's you're going to be potentially disorientated because they do affect different people in different ways. You're potentially going to struggle to identify friend and foe because uh, at the time, we're talking, you know, 9th, 10th and 11th centuries, uh, typically speaking, uh, for example, the Saxons and the Vikings wore very similar clothes and had very similar equipment. So, if you're already struggling to identify friend and foe, then you're going to struggle a lot more if you can't see or think clearly. So, I kind of struggle with, with that and I, I don't believe that there's a lot of examples of uh, mushrooms really causing um, aggression and the kind of characteristics that you would associate with uh, fighting and domineering in a battle scenario. There's a real lack of credible archaeology to associate and differentiate specifically a berserker grave from that, a grave of a traditional warrior so it's absolutely impossible to really distinguish uh, what may have been what. The Torslander plates uh, do depict warriors wearing bear skins and I think that's quite interesting. Um, I think that could have been around rites of passage. I, I think there could have been, uh, you know, uh, the progression from adolescence into adulthood. Uh, culminating perhaps in fighting a wild beast such as a wolf or a bear. I think that's entirely credible for certainly some aspects of society and especially people who wanted to prove themselves as a warrior. That may very well have been the rite of passage and if they killed that animal then they would have been able to wear the skin. I think that's absolutely possible. And so we start to move away from some of the uh, I guess the stereotypical kind of ideals around perhaps what a berserker may have been. And let's explore what it, uh, some more evidence. In the Volslander saga, I do apologise if I'm getting my pronunciation terribly mixed up. Uh, it refers to those berserkers who were called Volslander. I think that's interesting. This may have been a subgroup of berserkers, we're not really sure, and I, and I don't, I think there's only really speculate. Um, was that a particular nickname for these berserkers or, or um, was there a particular group uh, or was there a, a different level of berserker? Uh, it's, it's a bit difficult to know. So you can see that there's very little written primary source information around what berserkers actually could have been. If we look at the uh, act of going berserk then in the Gretti saga, there is a description of a berserker who's biting his shield and presumably trying to bring himself into a berserk state. And this particular warrior is trying to ambush someone, but the, the person uh, sees the berserker and strikes before the berserker has a chance to go into their berserker rage. And, and kills and beheads the actual berserker. I think there's a lot to be said for uh, this being a, an induced state. So if we think of it as a preparation for an event, so let's take 
athletes, for example, many high level, high performing athletes have a very strict routine that they do prior to every game or every match or every time they go on to the, the, um, into the pool or every time they go and lift weights. There's a very strict and very consistent routine that they do to bring themselves into that heightened state of energy and aggression and testosterone and adrenaline release. Much the same that you would see with MMA fighters or uh, other, other various forms of martial artists. The same that you might see with power lifters at a gym. Uh, you often see this with, you know, um, people who do cage fighting and that kind of stuff they're either slapping themselves or they get their coach to slap them and punch them around a bit to bring them into that state of aggression and adrenaline release modern soldiers i was a soldier for 14 years um, and i know that prior to every battle we would be doing a very strict very concise and, and, and very thorough battle preparation. We go through all of our gear, we build ourselves up mentally and prepare ourselves mentally for, for what's about to take place. Uh, I think that's really, really interesting. And I, th I think that has a lot to do with it. I'm gonna get this wrong with pronunciation, I'm very sorry. Verne's Ladia Saga. There is a description of a Viking saying that he has the anger come on even when he doesn't want it to and that actually strikes me as being PTSD uh, many veterans and, and I am a veteran many veterans talk about uh, flashbacks and uh, especially you know for years and years afterwards the slightest thing can sometimes really trigger someone into um, memories of battle and so on and I think uh, that is that is also very credible for parts of the um, the berserker rage we don't necessarily know of any particularly special um, armor weapons or equipment that a berserker may have been issued with or used. We don't know that there was anything particularly unique about how they acted. I do think it's interesting though that um, individual members of the Viking society were signified and designated by being able to wear particular skins of particular animals and that uh, showed their rank or place in society. And I think that's interesting because now we're, I, I think, starting to get somewhere here. And I, I think that a berserker myself, my, my personal belief is a berserker was more about a representative or perhaps a close personal bodyguard of the uh, Viking chieftain or Earl, Jarl, however you may wish to pronounce that. And I think this is interesting because uh, sometimes these particular people were used to demonstrate acts of particular bravery or courage, uh, such as walking through fire and so on. And to be able to choose someone who was very well proven in battle uh, may have been a significant advantage, particularly when it comes to duels and that kind of thing. I think that's that's a very credible possibility. As for the actual Berserker Rage itself, uh, I think it's highly credible that it's in the modern equivalent to it is called excited delirium. Uh, this is something that is uh, a, a term that is used a lot by police these days. Uh, and it explains particular people uh, who may be able, may be resistant to being um, hit by multiple tasers and be able to push through 
uh, you know, fights and confrontations with police. It's very interesting. I, I have a number of close friends who are police officers, and this is a term that they use quite a lot. Um, and I think it's possible that with a particular preparation and, and bringing yourself mentally into a prepared state for battle, then you have a possible explanation for how someone could bring themselves into this state of uh, excited delirium. And I think it's also quite credible that that could, um, if, if this is someone who is uh, a well-known warrior, then that could be used in a similar kind of way uh, to not only encourage morale within your own side, but to confront the enemy and cause fear and anxiety. So, for example, we, we see today the New Zealand Haka with their rugby team. Um, that is very much about a um, united morale lifting on their, their team and projecting their culture and their beliefs and trying to intimidate and raise fear in their opponents. Alrighty guys, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.